Members, the hour of one o'clock having arrived, I'm going to call the March 16th, 2021 meeting of the House Taxes Committee to order under remote rules uh, 10.01. And again, information for the public watching, the best place to get the information as far as the documents for this meeting is to go to the Minnesota House of Representatives website, then go to committees, go to taxes committee, and uh, on the right-hand side, you will find those materials. Uh, so with that, um, Ms. Griska, if you would please call the roll. Marquardt. Present. Marquardt, present. Liz Lagarde. Present. Liz Lagarde, present. Davids. Davids, present. Davids, present. Abaje. Present. Abaje, present. Carlson. Carlson present. Carlson present. Detmer. Detmer present. Detmer present. Garofalo. Garofalo present. Garofalo present. Gomez. Gomez present. Gomez present. Her. Her present. Her present. Her toss. Hertas, Howard, present, Howard, present, McDonald, McDonald, Miller, Miller, present, Miller, present, Moran, Present. Moran present. Mortensen. Present. Mortensen present. Robbins. Present. Robbins present. Sundell. Present. Sundell present. Schultz. Present. Schultz present. Stevenson. Present. Stevenson present. Swazinski. Present. Swazinski present. present. Joachim. Present. Joachim present. Hertas. Hertas present. Hertas present. McDonald. We have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Griska. We do have a quorum. And with that, we'll move to approval of the minutes. Representative Leslegard, would you care to move the March 10th, 2021 minutes? So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Les Lagarde moves approval of the March 10th, 2021 minutes of the Taxes Committee. Any comments, changes? Seeing none, I'm gonna ask members to uh, briefly unmute themselves as I call for the roll. All those in favor of those minutes, please say aye. 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 Those opposed aye. say nay. The motion does prevail. The March 10th, 2021 minutes are approved. Uh, members, I'd also like to direct your attention to the March 15th, 2021 uh, referral uh, to the Property Tax Division. Uh, members, the first bill up today is House File 1373. We have Representative Frazier here uh, before his first hearing before the Tax Committee. Welcome, Representative uh, Frazier. And we also will have Representative Keeler, who will be uh, presenting that bill also with him. So at this time, uh, would anyone care to move House File 1373? So moved. So moved. Re Representative Moran moves to lay over House File 1373 for possible inclusion into uh, the omnibus tax bill. Uh, Representative Frazier, you do have an amendment, uh, the A1 amendment. Uh, Representative Frazier, would you like to uh, get that? Uh, so we can get your bill in working order. Would you like to move, um, have that moved? Mr. Chair, I would. All right, thank you very much, Representative Frazier. Representative Moran uh, moves uh, approval of the A1 amendment. Uh, Representative Frazier, what does that do? And uh, Mr. Chair, in the interest of collaboration, I will allow Representative Keeler to speak to the amendment. Thank you. 
Okay, very good. Uh, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. This amendment takes the language that was originally in the bill from a flat 45,000 income to be able to utilize um, the, the qualifying indicators for free and reduced lunch. Um, so that's really the only change that we're adding. In the amendment, using free and reduced lunch takes into consideration the family size rather than a flat rate of income. Okay, so members, any questions on that? I mean, we'll, this is getting the bill into its order and we'll certainly have plenty of questions and comments if need be. So anything else? Uh, if not, we're gonna vote on the A1 amendment. Um, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion does prevail. The A1 amendment is adopted. So uh, I know there's another amendment uh, that could be offered here, but I think what we'll do right now is go over uh, the bill from the authors and then the presenters, and then we'll come back for amendments, further amendments and other discussion questions. So at this time, Representative Fraser or Representative Keeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have some brief remarks and then we'll turn it over to the testifiers that are here with us today. So the uh, K-12 education tax credit covers 75% of the cost of after school and summer, and summer school education, enrichment activities like tutoring, computer hardware, and software for educational purpose, school supplies, and the purchase or rental of some musical instruments. This bill makes several, several important updates to expand both the credits eligibility rules and usefulness at a time when low-income families across Minnesota are desperate for help to address the impact of distance learning on their students. The income limit for the maximum credit has not changed since 1997, so this bill will provide a much needed update and expand eligibility. This bill also reflects the increasingly digital nature of education, increasing the amount that can be used for educational computer hardware or software for a year from $200 to $300 and making monthly internet access fees an eligible expense. It would also take these changes and make them retroactive to the 2020 tax year provided some much needed relief for our families. With that, Mr. Chair, I will turn it over to the two testifiers that are here today to speak to this bill. And I'll, oh, thank you. And before we do that, Representative Keeler, do you have some comments on uh, House File 1373 as amended? Um, the only thing that, that I would add is that it's important that we, uh, we talk about the pandemic and how it's affected us so much and how it's affected our education system. Um, but that's not something that's just been happening in the pandemic. We have a lot of families that really struggle to provide supports at home um, for our kids to be successful in, in education. So I would just encourage everybody to support this. We can pass it on to testifiers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we move it on to the testifiers, the revenue estimate for 22-23 uh, in this biennium is $49.0 million. And for 24 and 25, it is 43.0. Six million dollars, and also there are some letters of support uh, from Youth Prize and many other groups with uh, along on that letter, and then also the East Side Neighborhood Services. So uh, with that, uh, we'll go to our first testifier, and kind of generally the rule in here about three minutes a uh, person uh, on testimony, and so uh, we have Matt Norris, Mr. Norris. Welcome Thank you, to the Mr. Committee. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Matt Norris. I'm the policy director and director of Minnesota After School Advance at Youth Prize, a statewide organization with a mission of increasing equity with and for Minnesota's indigenous, low income, and racially diverse youth. I come before you today urging you to make these important and, out and overdue updates to the K 12 education tax credit to help respond to the immediate needs of Minnesota families related to distance learning. I especially wanna thank Representative Frazier and Representative Keeler for their teamwork in bringing this bill before you today, along with the bipartisan group of legislators who support this proposal. You've all seen in your own districts and in your own families, the impact of distance learning over the past year. In fact, a recent report from McKinsey and Company found that distance learning could cause up to a year's worth of learning loss for our students. Therefore, it's no surprise that we've seen a dramatic spike in demand for Youth Prize's Minnesota After School Advance Program, which we operate in collaboration with Venn Foundation and helps families use this tax credit. We first experienced families needing assistance getting Chromebooks to allow their students to participate in distance learning 
and we help nearly a thousand families across the state use this tax credit to get those essential devices. More recently, we've seen a tidal wave of families seeking to use the tax credit to pay for tutoring and other academic enrichment services. In total, applications to our program were up 2,600% in 2020, and we serve families in 213 cities across the state. Again, that's a 2,600% increase in just one year and participants from 213 Minnesota cities. You know, given the desperation I hear in the voices of the parents I talk to, my heart breaks for those families in need who don't meet the outdated income limit for this tax credit. Families like one single father up on the range who's trying to raise his teenage daughter on his own after losing his wife to breast cancer. He's drawing on SSA survivor benefits in his 401k just to make ends meet, but he doesn't meet the current income guidelines for this tax credit. Or the family from Maple Grove. They've got eight kids. And while they earn a modest $50,000 a year, they see that housing takes up 54% of their family's post-tax budget. As a result, they simply don't have the resources to pay for things like tutoring or a Chromebook for every student in their household. Raising the income limit for this tax credit would be like flipping a switch. It's estimated that tens of thousands of families this year alone could benefit from this assistance that has become vital to their children's education. Similarly, increasing the amount that families can charge for computer expenses and making internet service fees el an eligible expense helps these families in a new world where a computer with internet access and not necessarily a classroom is often the forum for learning. This policy response would not require setting up any new programs to be administered by a state agency and it's already built into our tax forms. This is a common sense solution that has bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. It also has broad support across the state. I'm proud to share with you today a letter signed by approximately 90 organizations from school districts and the Minnesota Community Ed Association to cities and youth serving organizations. It's well past time that we make these critical updates to this tax credit and doing so has never been more important to provide this immediate assistance to so many families. As a result, I urge you to include this bill in the House's omnibus tax bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norris. And next up will be Abi Mohammed. And, and members, I'm gonna turn uh, the chair over to uh, Representative Yoakim. I have a bill up in the Environmental Committee right now. So I will head there. Uh, chair Yoakim, if you please take over the meeting at this point. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you, Mr. Nor Nornis, go ahead, sorry. Mr. Muhammad, please state your name for the record and proceed. Mr. Muhammad, go ahead, please state your name for the record and proceed. He's on mute, okay, there we go. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, hello, Ms. Chairman, my name is Abdi Mohammed. I live in North Minneapolis. Uh, my daughter, Sophia, she's a seventh grader and she was struggling with math behind her grade level. And as a parent, I was trying to figure out how the best way to help her out. And I was nervous, she was nervous. She didn't even go to school sometimes because she didn't know how to do the math. And things were really bad for us. And I was looking for the best way to help her out. And I did a little bit of research until I found the Minnesota after school advance, you know, the youth prize. And I don't know how I will appreciate them, but they really helped us out. They gave us a Chromebook and they started helping me with my daughter with the tutoring. Unfortunately, my daughter was just doing the best thing she can. And then my income increased a little bit, you know, to, so I was not eligible for the program. And my daughter kept asking me why I'm not doing the tutoring. And I, I have to explain how to add the, what is the reason behind. I hope you guys will help us out. You know, we're not asking for an out, you know, it's just we need some help with the families. And I hope, you know, the legislature will do the right thing, you know, to help us out. And I really appreciate your time. I'm not going to keep you guys that long, but Sophia, she was lucky for about six, seven months, almost a year. You know, we have been working with, you know, tutoring. There's no way I could have afforded it, to be honest with you, without the help of the 
that may advance and they help us to give us a comic book and she's in a better place but it still need help so i add you all of you guys just to put this as your kids you know and i'm i have no doubt in my mind that you will do what's best for the kids it's not about me it's not about you it's about the kids you know who need help and i hope you know we'll get the help and i appreciate your time thank you so much Thank you so much, Mr. Muhammad. I think, um, I believe we'll go to questions for the testifiers first. Um, members, any questions for the testifiers, either Mr. Nor Norris or Mr. Muhammad? Any questions for the representatives? I hope I see uh, Representative Graffalo. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, to either the authors or the nonpartisan staff, at the beginning of the committee, there was a A1 amendment that was, um, or I believe it was the A1 amendment that was adopted. Um, we always let the authors get the bill in the form they'd like, and we didn't really have a conversation about that. But could we just have uh, one of the authors or nonpartisan staff explain the changes in that amendment? Representative Keeler, Representative Frederick, or you would you like to have nonpartisan staff explain? Madam Fraser, Chair, sorry. Oh, Representative Keeler. Sorry, Fraser. Did you want to go? Oh, I was gonna. I was gonna kick it over to uh, non uh, nonpartisan staff. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Um, who are nonpartisan staff would like to take this one? Uh, Chair Yuki. Yes, thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Chair Yuki and members. Uh, so the A1 amendment that was adopted. Um, it's replacing language in the bill. It would increase the phase out threshold for the credit. Um, so I think as Representative Keeler mentioned in the bill, the, the phase out threshold was set at a flat $45,000 uh, and then was to be indexed for inflation. So in the A1 amendment, the bill uh, sets the uh, phase out threshold at the federal uh, income eligibility guideline for reduced price lunch. Um, so that's 185% uh, uh, of the federal poverty line um, for 2020 uh, in federal law. And if you look at the bill summary uh, that was prepared for this bill, I've included some of the numbers of what the uh, the new the income threshold would be sort of at different family sizes, because as Rep Keeler mentioned, um, the, the income th uh, threshold would vary depending on the family size. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Representative Garofalo, any follow up? Uh, yeah, um, so Madam Chair and for, um, I guess, again, either either one of the presenters, it would seem that um, looking at the research that's been supplied by nonpartisan staff that this would actually the effect of the A1 amendment is that if you have a smaller family size, you would have a lower income cap. Is that correct? Mr. Williams? Uh, Chair Joachim and uh, Representative Garofalo. So I think for, um, if you look at the bill summary, uh, I'm trying to pull it up really quickly here. Um, I currently don't have that right in front of me, but I think for uh, individuals who have a family size of either one or two, um, the credit would be slightly lower than it is under current law. However, the credit is uh, the federal uh, income eligibility guideline for free and reduced lunch is indexed for inflation. So within a couple of years, it seems likely that even for a, a two person family size, that threshold would exceed um, the amount under current law. But I think that, and I'd also say that uh, it seems unlikely that someone would be able to claim this education credit if they had a family size of one, just because it's not possible to have a dependent in that situation if you have a family size of one. So I think for uh, it's you know for families that have two individuals in them, it's possible that the threshold be, would be lower under the bill um, than it is. A okay. So Mr. That, Williams, just so I can clarify real quick, um, so you're saying that that's that's not number of children in that left-hand column on the research summary; it's family size. Is that accurate? Uh, Chair Joachim, that's correct. That's family size. Thank you. Representative Garofalo. Yeah, thank you. So, Madam Chair, and to uh, either of the representatives, if I could just make a suggestion, nonpartisan staff did, you know, highlight the fact that in a couple of years, that problem would go away, likely would go away as a result of the automatic inflationary increases in it. But I think the intent, as stated by the authors, was to, you know, to only to expand eligibility, not to hurt anybody. You may want to... Um, you may want to have a hold harmless provision added to this bill. I don't have an amendment for your bill today, but it would just seem, you know, I don't think that was the intent of your bill is to take some people who are currently eligible and make them not eligible 
and you may want to consider some corrective language to to have some hold harmless language there. Do you have any, do either of the authors, do you have an opinion on that? Representative Frazier, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. Yes, that, that has been brought to our attention actually by a nonpartisan staff. We're gonna, we're gonna work on that piece. Okay, sounds good. Thank, uh, thank you. you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. Thank you. Any other questions for, uh, oh, for the testifiers or the authors of the bill before we move to the A2 amendment? Seeing none, Representative Robbins, I believe you have an amendment you'd like to offer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Yes, I'm bringing forward the A2, and I appreciate Representative Frazier and Representative Keeler's indulgence. Um, I'm offering it as a friendly amendment, and I hope it will be taken in that spirit. I've worked on this issue since 1997, and um, it's really important to me. So originally, Minnesota offered a tax deduction for middle-class families that started in 1955. It took 22 years to 1997 to get the credit added for low-income families. And I worked on this bill then, um, and it was during the Carlson administration, and we had to fight really hard to get that credit. The government actually went into a shutdown over this issue just to provide the credit for low-income families. And we did include computers at that time, which was really controversial, as I remember. So it's funny to see this now. and. So I've been working on this ever since because one of the things we didn't get done in the Carlson administration was tuition in the tax credit. And I know it's controversial members, but here's the deal. Middle-class families have been able to use their deduction for tuition since 1955. And it took 22 years to give even a credit for any of these education expenses to low-income families. Now here we are 24 years later and low-income families still cannot use it for tuition, even though middle-class families have been doing it for all these years. And I think it's a matter of equity. Low-income families should be able to use their credit for the same things that middle-class families can. And so I had a bill, or I have a bill last session, I have it this session, HF 153, that does the same things that the Fraser Keeler bill does. We increase the limits. We expand the eligibility, we increase the amounts. I'm all about all of that. But what we also do is add tuition into the tax credit. And the families members that would use this, it really makes the difference. So a couple of weeks ago, we heard the bill about the sales tax um, for food. You know, families that use the federal food program, their providers, um, don't have to pay the sales tax and the Banyan testified there. And I used to be on the board of the Banyan. I helped start that organization. Been working in the Phillips neighborhood for 20 some years. And there are a lot of families who go to public school and attend the Banyan. And there are a lot of families who go to private school on scholarship and can use the tax credit for that. And those families members have zero achievement gap with their peers, zero. It's not, it's not that it's not possible, it's that we're not opening up the system for everyone. And so I'm offering this members, I'm happy to keep working with you on it. This has been heard, my bill with the tuition piece has been heard in the Senate and it's moving over there. So I just ask you to consider this as a friendly amendment. It won't solve everything for every, everyone. It's not a silver bullet, but it's another tool that can be used to help families who need every opportunity for their kids. So I. I humbly ask members for your support for this amendment. But, Thank you, but I'm sorry, I, I forgot. I'm, I am going to withdraw it, but I wanted to make the argument. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Robbins. Representative Frazier. Yes, uh, Representative Robbins, thank you for bringing the amendment for one, and thank you for all the work that you've done in the past on this to kind of get us to where we are today, where we're actually just adjusting this versus fighting for it to cause another government shutdown. I, I appreciate that. And, and thank you for reaching out to me early and, and having a phone conversation with me as well. I, I, I do, I take you at your word that it's friendly, not malicious, um, and, I, and I appreciate that. Um, and, and I appreciate you withdrawing it, but I, I would love to have more conversation um, I, to, to talk deeper about the, the families that you re, that you just referred to as well. But I really appreciate that. I just wanna let you know that and, and we'll have continued conversations. Um, I would have been, had you not withdrawn, I would have been hesitant to accept it because the stakeholders have not had a chance that have worked on this bill to talk about that. And that would have been the reason, but um, let's continue conversations. I appreciate that. Thank you, Representative Frazier. Seeing no other further questions from members, um, 
Representative Frazier, Representative Keeler, any final words? Representative Keeler, if you'd like to close out. Go ahead, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, it's actually been exciting to present a bill together. This is the behind the scenes what collaboration looks like. And I appreciate um, Representative Robbins for the ability to open up and, and continue to work on this collaboratively. I think we do the best work when we come together. Um, and again, this is just designed, um, like Mr. Muhammad said, it's focused on our kids. We want to do the very best that we can to help our kids achieve um, in our education settings because we know that that benefits the next generation. So I appreciate you all listening um, and taking this into consideration. Thank you, Representative Keeler, and thank you, Representative Frazier. With that, uh, Representative Moran renews her motion that House File 1373 is amended be laid over for possible inclusion. The bill is laid over. The next bill we have on our agenda is House File 1401 from Representative Becker Finn. Um, can I get a motion to move House File 1401 before the committee? So moved. Thank you, Representative Schell. Um, we have House File 1401 before the committee. Representative Becker Finn, thank you. Welcome back to taxes. Thank you and present your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members. Uh, this bill today addresses the incredibly high cost of child care uh, in our state. We have good programs that target help for families with very low incomes, and we need to maintain and increase those programs, but there is also a huge burden placed on families who don't qualify for those subsidies for folks who are at the very uh, lower end of the income spectrum. And as an example, I, I want to share an example. If you if you haven't paid for daycare any time in the last uh 10 to 15 years, uh, uh, there's a family in my district, some constituents, so we're in the Ramsey County suburbs. Um, they have two kids in daycare, they have a toddler and an infant, and they pay per year $45,600 per year just to have uh, one of the kids in uh, the infant in daycare three days a week and um, their toddler in uh, preschool uh, four days a week. And the reason they don't have the kids in school uh, five days a week is that they can't afford it. Um, and so I, you know, that's just one example of one family um, where, you know, the amount they're paying per year for daycare is more than what most folks make in income um, in an entire year. And I also want to note, um, importantly, that many, many families who are paying these huge amounts for child child care are the same families who are already carrying really high student loan debt. Um, the, the family that I shared the example of, um, one of, one of the parents is, is actually an attorney. And even as an attorney, um, all of their, all of his income is going to pay for student loan debt and child care. And so, you know, when we think about the high cost of housing and everything else that a family has to pay for, um, you know, it's an, it's an incredible amount, um, incredible burden for many families uh, to be paying for uh, really expensive childcare when, at, as, as mentioned in the, the first bill today, uh, you know, we really want to make sure all of our kids have access to good programs and, um, you know, really have the ability to thrive. And so specifically, this bill would increase the dependent care credit to 2.5 times what the current amount is allowed federally. And, um, you know, we get, I, I can get into more of the, the nerdy details, but um, I do want to turn it over to my testifiers and then I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Representative becker -Pin. I believe I have a first up, uh, Ms. Bragg, welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Margie Bragg. I'm the director of Northeast Child Development Center, a program of Eastside Neighborhood Services. I've worked in early childhood education for the past 43 years, and I have seen many programs develop that support the very low income families and families who are transitioning off of public assistance. I have extensive experience working with CCAP families, parent aware families, and Hennepin County Strong Beginnings Program, all good programs that address the needs of low income, high risk families. But I am here to be the voice for the hundreds of families that I have met over my 43 years that are the working families, families that make a livable wage, but who need to continue working and need financial support to pay for quality childcare. We have lost those families from our programs. Our current enrollment is 10% low income, highly subsidized families. The remaining 90% of our current enrollment 
is families that are making 200% above 200% of poverty and can afford that full market rate for early childhood education. It's well known that childcare programs that are balanced socioeconomically as well as diversely are strong, healthy, early learning environments. Families living between 100 and 200% of poverty cannot afford the 40 to 50% of their annual income to pay for childcare. Many middle income families who enroll are forced to drop out of the program when they have a second child. This tax credit will help working families who experience an instability in their childcare situations. Please note that this tax credit is not public assistance. It is a solution to keep parents working. This is particularly important as a preschool benefit for children to be able to catch up with skills needed to go to kindergarten and be successful thereon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bragg. Um, next up, I've got Ms. Martin. Please state your name to the rec for the record and, and proceed. I do that all the time. Sorry about that. I'll start over. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I am Christine Martin, and I'm the president of Eastside Neighborhood Services, a nonprofit in Northeast Minneapolis that has served this community and others for over 100 years. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, uh, and I will begin. Over the past three decades, my work has included treatment for youth in correctional settings, quality assurance for youth in community settings, a countywide initiative to end dropouts in Hennepin County, the African-American Babies Project in St. Paul, the St. Paul Promise neighborhood, and even community schools. I am honored now to lead a nonprofit in Northeast Minneapolis that has both an alternative high school of the Minneapolis Public Schools and a high quality four-star early learning center. What I, um, what I have been involved with over the years has always circled back to uh, kids can't learn, education disparities, and then what? Well, we began to talk about social determinants of health as a reason why kids can't learn or aren't doing so well or have um, uh, disparities in, uh, by race. Uh, then we talked about poverty, or maybe we talked about poverty first and then racism, but we're always coming up with reasons why kids can't succeed in school. I don't want to dispute all of that today, but I do want to say that I believe that there are solutions in front of us and lever leveraging solutions is an even better strategy. What we're talking today with you about makes sense economically, socially, and morally. There are countless working families who are not in poverty, but still find real barriers to affordable childcare. Families take shortcuts, make difficult decisions, and children's development can be compromised. There are solutions in front of us, as I have said. Incentives such as tax credits are a pathway that already exists, and we are suggesting an update and adjustment upwards of the child independent, uh, tax, uh, child independent care tax credit. Increasing this tax credit by two and a half times the current federal amount would put enough money back in the pockets of working families to reduce their overall child care costs by uh, nearly 30%. Decades of research shows that tax credit policies work in attacking poverty in a progressive, economically viable way. The earned income tax credit and the child independent care tax credit lead to sustained employment and higher earnings, reduction in second generation of poverty, improved education outcomes for children, and sometimes even a reduction in teen pregnancy rates. Research on education disparity also reinforces these anti-poverty tax policies by demonstrating that racially and economically diverse early learning environments lead to higher achievement for all, better social inclusion, for all and increased vocabulary for all. Many daycares can attract families who use CCAP and parent aware, like Marjorie had said earlier, 
Both of those programs are supported by the Minnesota government. But working families have had increasing difficulty paying for even our center in a working class neighborhood. We have unintentionally segregated learning environments and we want to change that. We are striving for an integrated learning center where families, where barriers for families are mitigated. Children six months to five years are like sponges. They play and they learn with gusto and are less likely to develop bias to difference. This is good for our communities and good for our state. And finally, we recognize that the federal stimulus bill currently has included a one-time increase in the federal tax credit, and we might have to make some adjustments in this bill. What is going on at the federal level shines a light on the viability of our efforts here, um, as both emphasize work, tax credits, equity, and poverty reduction. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you, Ms. Martin. And members, I forgot to draw your attention to the uh, revenue um, estimate that's in your packet, about $35 million a year going on forward. So with that, members, do we have any questions for the testifier or representative, uh, testifiers or Representative McAfee? Uh, representative McDonald. Thank you, Chair Joachim. Uh, Representative Becker Finn, uh, I'm, many folks are aware of the very high cost of childcare, and some would think, you know, it's a very tough decision. That should they just stay home and instead of having that expense and raise the children or uh, have that expense for daycare? Just um, have you, in your uh, research, found maybe a couple of things that are definitive as to why the cost? Is so high. Now, I realize that there's many different um, aspects that would uh, cause that, but just if one or two things that you see as to why the cost is so high to some. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question. I, I, I had not researched that question <laughs> ahead of time, um, you know, so I can't say for sure. Um, I know that, you know, I mean, part of it is if you think about it, the people that we want taking care of our kids, obviously we want those people to be qualified, well-trained people. And there is um, inherently going to be a cost to that um, if uh, we're, we're relying on, on folks to provide that care. Um, you know, I, I know anecdotally <clears throat> that it's a lot more expensive, uh, you know, in, in the metro area and the suburbs. Um, than in some other areas, but I think um, it, it's not an easy nut to crack to figure out uh, why it's so expensive. Um, but again, you know, I always told myself, my kid, this, this, my kids are no longer in need of childcare. But I know that it is, it is definitely um, ask anyone with kids in daycare if they've done the math to figure out whether it's worth even having a job. Um, because you know, a lot of times when you do that math, you find out. You know, I know in my first job when I only had one kid in uh, my first job as an attorney when I only had one kid in daycare, um, I was losing money um, by by working. Uh, and you know that we don't want folks to be in that situation. And certainly, um, folks who are are trained and coming out of school, we want them to be able uh, to be you know productive working uh, members of of the economy. If that's what uh, what the plan was. <laughs> Representative McDonald, follow up. Thank you, uh, Chair Joachim, Representative Becker Finn. Just curious on the example that you gave of the attorney who uh, has the 45,000 some odd with some change in daycare plus his um, uh, student loans. Now, your bill wouldn't uh, go to uh, that kind of a demographic, would you? Would it? Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, potentially, uh, I will remind you that uh, the starting <coughs> salary, for instance, uh, we just heard in my committee this morning for a legal aid attorney is only uh, 50000 you know, around $50,000 a year. So, um, you know, not all attorneys are, are, are making, <laughs> you know, extremely high amounts of money, uh, particularly in, uh, you know, civil legal aid and other public service uh, areas. Representative McDonald. Thank you. That'll complete my questions. Thank you, Chair Joachim and Becker, Representative Becker Finn. Thank you. Members, any further questions? Seeing none with that, uh, Representative Schultz renews her motion that House File 1401 be laid over for possible inclusion. 
the bill's laid over, and with that, I will turn the ritual gavel back to Chair Mark Ward. Thank you very much, Chair Joachim, for transferring over the virtual gavel. It's a light one. So uh, next uh, bill on the agenda is House File 1816. Representative Kotitsa Watun, uh, welcome to the committee. And can we have someone move that uh, bill, please? So moved. So moved. Representative Joachim uh, moves House File 1816 be laid over for possible inclusion in the House ta Tax Omnibus Bill. Representative Kotitsa Watun, welcome to the committee. And um, I know you have an amendment, would you? I uh, like that amendment move first to put your bill into the proper order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I would um, I would appreciate somebody moving the A1 amendment. Just it's a quick technical change to get the bill in the shape that I would like. Very good. Um, Mr. Chair, I will uh, I will uh, make that motion to accept your amendment, especially because she has this cute little baby there. So that's what motivated me. Yes. That's great. Representative McDonald uh, moves the A1 amendment. And um, any questions or thoughts on that? If not, I'm going to move to the vote. All those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion does prevail. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Kotitsa Watun to your bill, House File 1816, as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, for the record, I was intending to, to do a solo presentation on the, the bill today, but my, my partner just woke up from his nap. Um, you know, Representative, I don't know if I really believe that. I, I think anything you can do to help get a bill through, and but um, that's just good legislating. Very, very good. Please proceed. Babies are bipartisan, right? So. <laughs> I think they are. Yes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, House File 1816 is a proposal to expand and amend the uh, Angel Tax Credit Program, which is a key part of cultivating Minnesota's startup ecosystem and generating economic growth for decades to come. Uh, so historically, when Minnesota has not had a tax credit in place, we've seen fewer health technology companies receiving startup investments than in the years that a tax credit is in place. Um, in fact, a higher number of companies receive additional funding in private investments after utilizing the angel tax credit. This is roughly a three to one ratio of additional private investments. And um, the percentage of private investments from out of state has increased every year since 2014. So um, it's, it's really um, helping Minnesota companies continue to grow um, and, and bringing in dollars from out of state. So um, we, one thing that I want to highlight is that between 2015 and 2020, 2020, um, women owned health tech businesses have received um, almost $6 million of the funding, um, Vios Medical, Eva MedTech, and um, Precious Status have both received over $100 million, and um, that female owned health tech organizations have raised a total of over $11 million in funding during that same time period. So um, during the same time period, minority owned health tech businesses have received almost $9 million of the funding. Um, Stemonix and MyMed both received over $2 million in those funds. And they have raised a total of 40, almost $50 million in funding during that same time period. So um, I have a number of testifiers here with me today to kind of share their stories and how the Angel Tax Credit has really um, boosted their, um, their business. And I would like to, um, uh, I would stand for questions after, um, after the testifiers share their stories. Thank you very good, much, Representative. And first of all, in the revenue estimate, it is uh, $20 million a year beginning in uh, fiscal year 23, and then for 24 and 25, also $20 million a year. There's also a letter of support from the Medical Alley Association. And so with that, uh, we'll go to testifiers. And again, if you could keep your testimony to about three minutes, that'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, Lily Melander is first, and then Raj Shah is on deck. So um, Lily Melander, you would... Um, Introduce yourself and welcome to the committee. 
Chair and members of the committee, my name is Lily Melander, State Policy and Advocacy Director for the Medical Alley Association, representing over 600 members from the health innovation and care community. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of the ANGEL tax credit program. This legislation is an important step in continuing to grow Minnesota's innovative ecosystem, fostering an environment for innovators and generating growth for decades to come by attracting investment dollars for in-state innovators and sustaining Minnesota's status as a regional competitor. The ANGEL tax credit program has broad support from a wide range of industries, including agriculture, clean technology, high tech, and healthcare, generating over 400 $450 million in investment to 430 uh, Minnesota startups and emerging companies since its inception in 2010. The Angel Tax Credit helps entrepreneurs, um, oh, helps entrepreneurs from around the state access capital to start and grow their business in Minnesota, with half of the program's funding targeted towards minority, women, or veteran-owned businesses, or those businesses located in greater Minnesota. The Angel Tax Credit program provides a benefit for the entire state. The stability of the program is paramount to demonstrating consistent support for entrepreneurs and ensuring they choose Minnesota as a place to find and grow their innovative companies. It provides assurance to startups as they plan out their finances and it's critical to continuing to reach into targeted communities and unlock investment and growth for underserved entrepreneurs. The demand for the program has been evident as available credits in 2019 were exhausted in just over five months. And this year, when the funding resumed in 2021, after a gap year in funding, um, as of March 15th, there was 1.3 million in general credits um, that remain. The Angel Tax Credit Program is vital to keep Minnesota's a destination for entrepreneurs across technology sectors. Without it, investment dollars will go elsewhere and companies that have a shot at making significant impacts in the world will struggle to reach their full potential. Providing ongoing funding for the program at $20 million is one important thing the state can do. Um, and to conclude, for Minnesota to maintain its global leadership or its global position as a global epicenter of health innovation and care, Minnesota must provide stable funding for the Angel Tax Credit Program so today's entrepreneurs can launch the companies to fight tomorrow's health, energy, food, and technology challenges. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of House File 1816, and I will now turn it over to other members from the Medical Valley community. Thank you very much, Ms. Melander. Uh, next, we have Raj Shah, and then Ping Ye is on deck. Mr. Shah. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Raj Shah. I'm the CEO of MyMeds. Uh, we started our company here uh, effectively about nine years ago. And without the angel tax credit, it would have been very difficult for us to raise the money and sustain what we've been able to do. Um, we did max out on the uh, amount that you can raise through the angel tax credit. And as I said, that that is given us the stability to grow the company. And this year we anticipate we'll be doubling our footprint of employees in Minnesota. Um, it took a while. I mean, digital health has taken a while to get adopted, but because of the COVID pandemic, what we took 10 years or tried to do in 10 years got done in 10 days. And, um, and I think that's important. But one of the key factors for us is we were asked to move our company multiple times because Minnesota hasn't always been the easiest place to raise money uh, for small companies. Um, and you know, with minority investment and the, the minority extension of this tax credit, that allowed me, for example, uh, to take full advantage because it gave me more time to find investors uh, to do that. But I would strongly encourage uh, this group to continue to fund this uh, angel tax credit, not just for this year, but for every year thereafter, and consider raising the amount because when we're talking to states around us, like Wisconsin and North Dakota, they also have favorable tax credits and companies are choosing to open satellite offices there rather than doing it here. And in the medication, or sorry, in the medical world, I'm a, I'm a nephrologist, I'm a kidney doctor, and I practice, but I think it's important that Minnesota is the leader in healthcare. And every day, every state is touched by Minnesota companies. And the more companies like ours that can be started here are gonna be the future. And, and to give a plug for ourselves, we were just chosen by Walgreens Boots Alliance, the largest pharmacy company in the world, they chose our technology as the Intel inside for everything they're going to be building moving forward. And had I moved to a different state, 
that may or may not have happened, but it's because of this tax credit that it did happen. And now everything we do, our technology is gonna go in the next one to two years to every Walgreens uh, in the country. And I think that that's huge. And it's because of the tax credit that we're able to do it. So I do hope and encourage that you guys will continue to support that because Minnesota really is what touches healthcare every single day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sean. First of all, congratulations and thanks for sharing your success story. Much appreciated. Uh, next up, uh, Ping Ye, and then uh, next would be John Pierce. Mr. Ye, welcome to the Good committee. Please afternoon. proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and committee. Can you hear me okay? We can. Perfect. Um, my name is Ping Ye, and I'm the co founder and CEO of Stemonics. Stemonics is a biotech company. Um, we make something a little unusual. We make human brains uh, from skin, and uh, we also create new software technologies to find safer and more effective medicines. Um, we very proudly manufacture um, our unique uh, items out of Maple Grove, Minnesota, and I'm also very proud that uh, over half of our managers at the company are first-generation U.S. citizens and BIPOC individuals. Um, I'm an engineer by training, and I founded the company um, in my basement in, Minnesota, in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, about uh, seven years ago after surviving lymphoma cancer. Um, Stemonics is an angel tax credit company as well, and um, it helped us raise our first uh, million uh, at the very beginning, and uh, which was extremely difficult. Um, since then, we've gone on to raise a total of 40 million um, to establish uh, our manufacturing plant, for example, uh, in Maple Grove. Um, and I can also share that um, in the seven years uh, of our existence, uh, we went from an idea in my basement in Eden Prairie to soon to be merging onto the NASDAQ. And um, we're all very excited um, for that. And it wouldn't have been possible without um, the angel tax credit and the support from Medical Alley um, as well. Um, as, as explained um, by the previous um, uh, example, this, this um, having an angel tax credit uh, is really going to enable not only the stomonic story, but also a story of many other entrepreneurs uh, to really um, foster a healthy and innovative uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, which in the end actually uh, will support the industry at large because of how the innovation ecosystem interacts with the general industry. So with that, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Thank you very much, Mr. Ye. Would you mind explaining again what your company does? You're saying you make brain from skin cells or what was that exactly? Could you yeah, explain that a little yeah. bit more? I find that- I would love to, I would love to. So the Nobel Prize winning technology in 2012 was the ability to turn um, really a biopsy of skin or blood, for example, and reprogram them into stem cells. So basically the ability to turn skin cells into stem cells. What we then do is we take those stem cells and we um, differentiate it. Uh, that's kind of the scientific word, but we, we convert those stem cells into various organ cells like brain cells and um, from there what we do is we um, do a lot of manufacturing uh, to them to shape them into little uh, tiny human brains and our little brains are about half a millimeter in size and they can not only be useful in finding safe safe medicines but also be used to find new medicines so this uh, the brains that we make could represent um, a child with seizures, or it could represent a form of autism, or it could represent uh, uh, Parkinson's uh, brains. Those are just ways that, we, and then we use these brains to, to test new chemistries to see what could actually help and support and rescue um, the fu functionality back to healthy or normal. Amazing. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in light of the discovery today, perhaps uh, 
perhaps this assembly line could be brought to the House DFL caucus to help you out with your shortage of brains. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. Couldn't resist. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Garofalo. Uh, yes, there could be many uses for that technology. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move to John Pierce. Mr. Pierce, thank you for being here and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and uh, committee people. I, I don't <clears throat> I don't make brains by any by any measure, uh, <laughs> but very much uh, applaud the work that Ping is doing. Um, I, I'm here to, to strongly support the, uh, the continued support for the Minnesota Angel Tax Credit. Uh, for the foreseeable future and, and make it as, as big and generous as possible. Uh, so I started a company called Zipnosis about 12 years ago. And the idea was that we were going to transform how and where patients providers connected for care. It was an idea that was definitely ahead of its time, but in that ensuing 12 years, we have become a national leader in virtual care and healthcare disruption, um, especially with the advent of, 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 of virtual first ecosystem. So when I started Zipnosis, I entered the Minnesota Cup in a very uh, um, sort of uh, naive way as a student at the uh, grad student at the University of Minnesota, and immediately got a lot of attention from early investors through the Minnesota Angel Tax Credit. And it was that money that allowed us to survive and iterate and innovate for years and years, as, as Raj mentioned, that's very necessary in the healthcare ecosystem. And what's unique and powerful about the Minnesota Angel Tax Credit is that it really unlocks the pool of capital of investors that are investing in people and entrepreneurs. And that is really, really vital here in Minnesota because other ecosystems in the Valley, Boston, Texas, they have a much more mature and I would say open philosophy towards risk capital. The Minnesota Angel Tax Credit allowed me to receive investment from individuals who would otherwise sat on the sidelines. And that has made all the difference in the 12 year journey of Zipnosis and allowed us to be a national leader in virtual care and become one of the highest volume virtual networks in the entire country based here in Minnesota. So as you guys contemplate um, how long you wanna continue this and how much you wanna fund, I can tell you on behalf of myself and, and dozens if not hundreds of other Minnesota entrepreneurs, um, please continue it. Um, it's a competitive advantage, it's a necessity and will help continue to unlock um, what we think is really vital risk capital to help fund entrepreneurs in Minnesota and keep jobs and innovation here. So thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. A question for Mr. Pierce. So ahead, Zip Representative no McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Pierce, Zipnosis in healthcare. Could you uh, spell that for me and then just give us uh, maybe just a little bit of quick uh, synopsis of uh, some of the particulars that you do with your company? Yep, it is Z I P N O S I S. That's the way I spelled so, it. Yep. Uh, so, uh, what we do, our business is licensing our virtual care technology to healthcare providers around the country. Um, so, a number of Minnesota systems <clears throat> use it. Um, Align would be a really big one here in town who uses the technology. They use their providers, they put their brand behind it, and effectively we become that digital front door to the health system. So, um, we were absolutely essential in COVID um, and helping get uh, patients screened, treated virtually without coming into the clinic over this past year. Representative McDonald, anything further? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Pierce, just curious, what uh, did you state in your testimony of uh, the funding, the amount of your funding to start up from the angel credit? Mr. Yeah, Pierce. I was trying to look... Oh, thank you. I was trying to look back on that. I, it was pretty close to about a million dollars, I think, uh, from a handful of individuals. We've raised about 30 million in total. Um, we are based here in Minneapolis, um, uh, but I think it was close to that. And I can tell you the investors who put early, early, this was pre-revenue, um, all were um, um, contingent on getting a Minnesota Angel tax credit as a part of their investment. So it was really, really essential for us. Anything further? Yeah, Mr. Yep. Chair, one more follow-up. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Pierce, uh, I'm, I supported the angel credit uh, in the past and probably will continue to do so. I know the, uh, I know the great it comes from, uh, you know, from Medtronics on down to your company. So did you say that uh, you raised $30 million yourself and if you didn't get the million from this angel credit that it probably wouldn't have gotten off to a start or, or yeah, the, the, what you had? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I the two options. Wrong? No, you got it. So 
the two options were to move to California. That would have been option number one, where I would have found a better, easier capital pool, but that wasn't what I wanted to do for a whole bunch of reasons or not do the business. I mean, that was, it was pretty binary and Minnesota angel tax credit was absolutely essential in getting that started. Anything further representative McDonald? No, it's good to hear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just lastly, so you raised the 30 million. If you didn't get the million from the angel tax credit, you probably would have uh, went to California or what? Yeah, I, yeah. Or, or, or no business. Yeah, I mean, I, it's that simple. I don't mean to be dramatic, but I mean, when, when you're pre-revenue and especially in Minnesota, I remember very directly the investors saying, if we can't qualify for Minnesota angel tax credit, we will not make this investment. Anything further? No, Mr. Chair, just uh, shows you the uh, the power of this uh, particular uh, program. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Hurtas. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the testimony of these uh, entrepreneurs, uh, exciting uh, front in terms of new technologies. Uh, I don't have a question, Mr. Chair, but I just wanted to comment that this is really a testimonial to the fact that we have an angel credit investor uh, system, but uh, it's so important to have people who are capable of being those investors. And so as we have continued to uh, talk about tax policies, we need to make sure that some of our most successful Minnesotans stay in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, before I go to other members, is there anyone from the public that's on the Zoom meeting, anyone that would like to testify for or against House File 1816 as amended? I don't see any, any other members' questions for the author or for the testifiers. If not, Representative Kotitsa Watun, uh, you've been back in 2019, it was your bill that we ended up uh, having in the um, omnibus bill and ultimately going into law. So thank you so much for your work. We do have one more question. Representative Garofalo. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, first of all, it's not about this bill. So when you're done with this bill, um, I just want to, oh. uh, I want to make sure that we have clear expectations for the public on, wait until this bill's done and then we can talk about it. Very good. So Representative Tisa Watoon, any closing thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members. I appreciate you hearing the angel tax credit today. Um, thanks to all the testifiers. Um, perhaps as uh, Representative Garofalo alluded to um, with Mr. Ye's testimony that these tiny brains originally started being made in Eden Prairie, just goes to show that so many of my constituents are much smarter than I. Um, and I appreciate their, their uh, insight and their contributions to the state of Minnesota. Um, so uh, this, this is such a critical program. I, um, I specifically want to highlight again that the 50% the reserved uh, focus for female uh, entrepreneurs, for minority-owned businesses, for veteran-owned businesses, and then for businesses in, in greater Minnesota. Um, and, and I think that the consistency of this uh, funding availability is just going to be critical to continuing to um, uh, support our Minnesota economy going forward. And I appreciate the support. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Representative, was it Representative Joachim who, no, Representative McDonald. Uh, well, I, I lowered, thank you, Mr. Chair. I lowered my hand, but I was gonna tell Representative, because he, uh, Representative, because uh, he would that if I didn't get to see the baby one more time, that I don't know if I'll support the bill. But <laughs> it, it, when, you, when you brought it, it up, everybody was smiling. So good, God bless you and your motherhood there. Thank Very you. good. Uh, Representative Joachim, I think you were the one that made the motion, is that correct? So Representative Joachim, renews her motion to lay over House File 1816 as amended for possible inclusion into the omnibus uh, tax bill. Uh, Representative, well, we're gonna, let's move to the next item on the agenda, uh, House File 277. Uh, Representative Robbins, uh, would you care to introduce your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I move House File 277 for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. Very good. Uh, that's been moved and you have an amendment. Would you like to move that at this time? I would, Mr. Chair, I move the A2 amendment. 
Representative Robbins moves the A2 amendment. Uh, any comments on that? Members, the A2 is just a technical amendment that was brought to me by the Department of Revenue. And basically it just cleans up some language um, that they also did this amendment in the Senate. And so they just wanted them to be identical. So I'm happy to accept it. It's, it's very, just switching out a few words, it's, it's very technical. Very good. So members, any questions on that? Uh, otherwise, Representative Robbins moves the A2 amendment. I'm gonna call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed aye. say nay. Aye. The motion does prevail. The A2 amendment is adopted. Representative uh, Robbins to your bill, House File 277 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I really appreciate you giving this bill a hearing. I also am, am a big supporter of the bill we just heard from Representative Katiza Watoon, the angel investor credit. And this bill would um, sort of be an extension of that. So we already have an R&D credit in Minnesota, but this creates an alternative simplified credit for taking the R&D tax credit. So it just creates a third option for how Minnesota businesses can take the R&D credit and it mirrors what um, the federal uh, federal law also has this alternative simplified credit that we have not implemented in Minnesota. So it brings us sort of in line with what's going on federally. And um, I just wanna say that it's really important for our businesses. As, as you heard, the angel credit is so important. This bill um, can only be used for research and development that's done in Minnesota. So if they have other plants, other places, you know, they can't use it for that. It's only for what happens on the ground in Minnesota. And it really incentivizes our companies here to do their research and innovation here. And that investment drives jobs, it drives innovation, it helps us attract top talent to our state. These incredible people we met today in the earlier testimony, we want to have our University of Minnesota students stay here and build their companies. We want to attract new researchers here. So this alternative simplified credit just provides another avenue for that. And I do have to clarify just to make sure the amendment we had drafted is technical, but the department did want me to change a little bit of how um, the original draft um, uh, creates the credit. So in the original draft, um, it would do a 6% on all qualified research expenses over the base amount. That had to be figured out over a three-year um, average. And for startups, since there is no three-year average, um, what the technical amendment does is it just says 50% of the current year for people that don't have a three-year R&D record. So I just wanna be clear that that's not really just a change of words. There is a little bit of a, a, of a substantive change there, but it's recommended by the department and I was happy to accept that. So I have several testifiers. So Mr. Chair, if you would, no members have questions. I'm happy to go to the testifier. And was thinking about. Thank you very much, Representative uh, Robinson. So before we go to testifiers, the revenue estimate for 22-23 by any is 39.9 million, and for 24 and 25, it's 46.8 million. There also is a letter from um, IBM, and I think we also have a testifier of support. So. With that, Tori Johnson is first, and then Gabriella Spence is next. So, um, Tori Johnson, uh, welcome good. to the committee, and please identify yourself. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And for the record, my name is Tori Johnson, and I'm the Minnesota Senior State Executive for IBM, and I'm based in Rochester. So, Chair and members of the House Tax Committee, I'm here to speak in support of House File 277. This alternative simplified tax credit is important to IBM and is something we've been supporting for a number of years. So I, on behalf of IBM, would like to thank Representative Robbins for bringing this forward. Now, many of you know IBM has had a major presence in Minnesota for over 65 years. I myself started at IBM in Rochester over 38 years ago after graduating from the University of Minnesota. The work our IBMers do here in Minnesota has changed dramatically over the decades as our industry has transformed. But through all the years of change, the one constant has been our relentless focus on innovation. Our talented workforce of engineers and scientists do groundbreaking work on cloud technologies, artificial intelligence, chip development, quantum computers, and continue to support 
Summit and Sierra, which are the which were for the past three years the number one and number two most powerful supercomputers in the world, which and they reside at the U.S. Department of Energy. Summit, for instance, is is used for cancer research, and over the past year has been instrumental in accelerating research and the development of COVID vaccines. So IBMers in Minnesota are really glad to, to play a part in uh, our rebounding from COVID. Also, IBM is a leader in Minnesota for patents with over 500 US patents published last year by IBMers in, in our state. As you can tell, innovation is our lifeblood at IBM and essential programs like the R&D tax credit fuels innovative research that benefits all Minnesotans. The alternative simplified credit will bring increased investment into the state of Minnesota by a more simplified process to access the programs. This bill will provide a more competitive landscape for Minnesota in attracting and retaining innovative research. It will help sustain and grow the ecosystem of technology and innovation in Minnesota. And this ecosystem, as Representative Robbins talked about, includes large companies like IBM, as well as angel investors and startups that we just heard from. We're all codependent on each other for success and we'll thrive, we all thrive based on a talented Minnesota workforce of technology professionals. In fact, my first manager at IBM, Al Burney, now leads a Minnesota digital health startup in Rochester. And I have many former colleagues that are continue to work in this industry in Minnesota at, at startups and companies of all sizes. IBM is proud to be in Minnesota for 65 years, and we'd like to be here another 65 years. This is my brief statement, and we provided a more uh, detailed written statement. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. At this point, uh, Gabriella Spence, and then Beth Cadoon is on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Gabriella Spence, and I'm a policy and advocacy manager at the Medical Alley Association. We're the cross-sector healthcare association that supports and advances Medical Alley's global leadership in health innovation and care. We are grateful to Representative Robbins for bringing forward HF277 and are proud to support this initiative to improve access to Minnesota's research and development tax credit. Medical Alley Association has consistently supported positive changes to this credit from refundability to increasing the percentage in order to make Minnesota a more attractive place for not only large companies to invest their dollars, but also for startups and emerging companies to begin their journey. A key industry in Minnesota is health innovation and care, the lifeblood of which is research and development, just like Mr. Johnson mentioned. The industry employs nearly 500,000 Minnesotans and has a more than $60 billion economic impact. In order for our state to continue competing on a national and global level for the industry's high paying jobs, technology and expertise, investments in the R&D tax credit must be made. We often hear from our members who have received the R&D credit, but the credit itself did not outweigh the costs incurred from initially filing. Additionally, due to the complexity of the credits, companies claiming them can frequently find themselves in the middle of an audit, which further drives down the benefit of claiming the credit. HF277 helps companies save money by making it easier to file and reduces the chances of audits by simplifying the calculation process. To maintain and expand our state's reputation as the global epicenter of health innovation and care, Minnesota must create a business environment that attracts investment and increases the opportunity for health innovation and care organizations to succeed. Enhancing the research and development tax credit like HF277 does is a strong step in that direction. Thank you and I'm happy to provide any further information. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Spence. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Beth Cadoon. Thank you, Ms. Cadoon, welcome to the committee. We state your name. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Beth Cadoon. I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Thank you to Representative Robbins for authoring this bill, and we urge your support. Innovation has been an important component of Minnesota's past success, and we know it will be critical to our future success. Businesses that innovate, create new products and services tend to be more profitable and stronger than businesses that do not. We have heard from many of our companies the importance of the R&D credit and their ability to not only keep R&D jobs in the state, but also to grow their R&D activity. Um, a key point for the R&D credit that Representative Robbins mentioned was that this activity has to be done in the state as well. 
Although we've heard from many businesses on the importance of the R&D tax credit, we've also heard from many businesses, especially from our small and mid-sized companies, on the difficulties in calculating the credit and the uncertainty caused by audits that were mentioned. And we've also heard where the R&D activity is allowed at the federal level, but not in Minnesota for their, for their tax credit. I just wanna give an example of the difficulties in calculating this credit when we're using the base year from the 1980s. For example, if a 40 year old company with R&D activities and sales revenues from the 1980s wants to claim the R&D tax credit, in 2021, the company would have to look back to books and records 30 plus years ago to properly calculate Minnesota's tax credit. This tax can be extremely difficult, problematic, and as time goes on, um, very, very hard to do, if not virtually impossible. So this bill will allow more taxpayers to be able to utilize our, our tax credit in the state. And this was what was found at the federal level when they imposed this new or allowed this new um, calculation in 2006, as they found more taxpayers were able to utilize the credit, which is what we wanna see in Minnesota. So we would urge you to include this in your omnibus tax bill. I also wanted to say um, that we're also in favor of the angel tax credit. So the previous bill you heard, we believe that's also another great um, bill to provide that, that startup activity that we need in the state. So thank you and we urge your support. Uh, thank you. Um, at this time, anyone else um, other than members care to testify for or against House File 277 as amended? All right, uh, members, questions, uh, Representative Gomez. Sorry, Mr. Chair, did you call me? I did, Representative. Okay, um, thank you so much. I guess, um, you know, as I'm thinking about this, I just, I, I wanted to go back to the beginning of tax committee that we had in 2019. Um, or so we were presented with this uh, pr program evaluation from the Minnesota State Auditor on this research tax credit. And we haven't made any of the modifications that were recommended in this, in this uh, evaluation. And I just wanted to kind of speak to a few of them because I think broadly with this credit, it's the, this program evaluation kind of reveals some challenges that I think if we're going to change the program, that instead of focusing on expanding it, that we should really be focusing on making it better. Um, or, or at least if, if we're proposing expanding it, that we should be implementing some of these changes. So, you know, I guess just broadly, like, this isn't necessarily an issue with it, but just, just for context, um, an overwhelming majority of the money that, that we spend on the research tax credit goes to the largest, most profitable corporations in the state of Minnesota. It's overwhelmingly to C corporations. And within the category of C corporations, it's overwhelmingly to the absolute biggest companies that operate in the state of Minnesota. Um, so, so I think when we're, when we're talking about a context where, you know, I know in my district and across the state, we have really small firms that are really struggling. If we're gonna be spending tens of millions of dollars to support businesses, I think we need to think about if we want to support those kind of largest, most profitable C corporations, or or we want to support our small businesses. Unfortunately, we live in a you know limited kind of context in that way. the The other piece about this is that you know there's no statutory def like kind of definition of purpose for the research tax credit. This was one of the major flaws identified in in the legislative auditor's report. So. Consequently, we don't, because, because there's no established purpose, we don't really have a, a method to evaluate whether this tax credit is effective at doing what we want it to do, because we don't say what we want it to do. Um, you know, it, even in the absence of an explicit kind of purpose statement in statute, uh, you know, the Office of, Le of the Legislative Auditor did, you know, kind of assume like, okay, if it, you know, Logically, if you're establishing this credit, you want it to create or retain jobs, increase research activity, attract or retain businesses. Um, what they found was that the Department of Revenue cuts doesn't, because of the lack of a, of, a, of a purpose statement, the Department of Revenue isn't really collecting the right kind of data to evaluate the effectiveness of this tax. But what they, when they did a, an analysis, which was from 2014, I think this is, this was published in 2017, 
the credit does not pay for itself. The credit pays for about a quarter of itself in terms of the, of, of the economic out, output. And so, so to me, I guess I'm concerned about the, a proposal to expand a credit that has, you know, an ill-defined purpose where, where we don't have a, a good way of evaluating its effectiveness and where it does not pay for itself. So that's just my comment. Um, I appreciate it, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Gomez. I did not serve on the tax committee last session and I have not read that OLA report. So I'm happy to take a look at it and discuss um, options with you further. I do want to point out that this really isn't expanding the credit in terms of who's eligible. It's just providing a third way to calculate it so that more people can take advantage of it. And I would uh, suggest that perhaps one of the reasons it hasn't been paying for itself is because it has been ridiculously complicated. So many people, the, the number of people who could use it, who don't, it hasn't been well utilized. And to your point about the large corporations, first of all, I have, I have so many companies in my district. I represent Maple Grove and uh, Rogers and Dayton. And we um, have many small C corporations that not only use the angel investment credit, but would use this if it was easier. They just, they don't have the bandwidth to do the calculations. And, and many of them are small companies. So first I wanna to speak to that. But secondly, the large companies are incredibly important to our state's economy, as was testified, $60 billion just in the medical device industry. And that's so many jobs and it's high paying jobs and it really helps attract great research talent. One of the best things about this credit is that it does require the R&D to be ha happening in our state. We don't want um, IBM or General Mills or Cargill or 3M or whoever, I can't remember all these big companies, but we don't want them to take their R&D to other states where they have other operations. We want that research done here and that we can get the benefit of the spin-offs like Mr. Johnson talked about one of his um, uh, former um, uh, um, employees or directors now has a different company. We want that research and that innovation to build on itself here in our state. So I do appreciate your concerns, Representative Gomez, and I'm happy to work with you on it. And I'll look at the OLA report, but I think this is really important to our economic growth. Uh, Representative Westlegard. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just more of a comment. Um, everybody knows that um, uh, my heart is with labor, but I learned a long time ago that if businesses aren't successful, labor doesn't have an opportunity to go to work and communities can't flourish. And as we look at uh, incentives or tax credits, if it's creating good jobs, good jobs that are sustainable, it comes back into our communities, it comes back into our families, and it's just something that we have to, I mean, I support. So uh, thank you for bringing this forward. I also su support the, uh, um, the angel tax credit. And I just think that any time that we can create opportunity um, for the people of Minnesota, I just think it's a good thing. So thank you for bringing it forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other members? See none, Representative Robbins, would you like to close? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I appreciate all um, the testifiers who supported this bill and the good questions. I really um, am all about trying to make Minnesota as competitive as possible so that we can retain and create even better jobs in a host of ecosystems here. So I hope you'll support the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Robbins and Representative Robbins uh, renews her motion to layover House File 277 as amended for possible inclusion into the House Tax Omnibus Bill. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Robbins. Uh, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate you're done with the agenda for the day, correct? We are done with the agenda for today, yes. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, you and I have known each other a long time. I think I'm a pretty laid back guy, and I certainly know that neither you nor I want to be the free speech police, uh, especially in these video conferences and we have this, you know, we have people working from home and we're going to see stuff, but I would hope that when we have future testifiers that um, people testifying would have the common sense to not have profanities displayed prominently behind them 
when they're testifying. Uh, we actually have kids in Minnesota who are watching our committee hearings as part of their homework assignment. And again, I know you don't want to be the speech police, neither do I, and we don't want to be drawn that, but clearly um, I would hope that when testifiers are coming before our committee, uh, they would know that this is, you know, this is not a bar, uh, this is not an adults only venue. Uh, we should be able to have a level of decorum and professionalism. And if there's anything we can do on our side of the aisle to help you and to help staff prepare um, testifiers for that, I think that would be very helpful. So I just wanted to point that out and hopefully we don't, um, we don't have to make you guys develop a policy telling people what they can and can't have or say in their background. So thank you. Uh, Representative Garoppolo, um, thank you, point well taken. And you know we all are kind of learning new things still with these remote Zoom meetings, but uh, certainly um, thought for rules to go out to, you know, advice to testifiers to, uh, you know, watch what their background looks like because, um, you know, you've got other members who may look at things in the background and it may help or hurt a particular um, you know, thing moving forward. So that's just something they have to consider and that's not uh, being speech police or anything else. It's just uh, a matter of how they wanna be presented. So uh, members, uh, we will meet uh, tomorrow and on Thursday. And with that, thank you for your work today. The tax committee is adjourned. Thank you.